John chapter 6, starting verse 60. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, This teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, asked them, Does this offend you? Then, what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and our life. But there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So Jesus said to the twelve, You don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied to them, Didn't I choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. He was referring to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, one of the twelve, because he was going to betray him. This is the word of God. In the mid-1800s, a Scottish Christian by the name of John G. Patton committed his life to go work as a cross-cultural missionary among village people on the Vanuatu Islands. So there's this cluster of islands near Australia, and at the time, it was well known that these inhabitants were cannibals. And so the first two missionaries that had already been sent to the islands were killed and eaten by cannibals the day that they arrived. And so it was difficult to find missionaries to go there. But this missionary, John Patton, was undeterred by that, and he felt called to go there, and he followed the calling of his Savior to take the good news of Jesus to these people. And as he was preparing to go, as you can imagine, he was full of anxiety and fear and doubt. Um, But as he said in his writings, this drove him to prayer and dependence upon the Spirit. And toward the time of his departure, there were many people who were discouraging him from going, even other Christians. And there was specifically one respected elder in the church who told him, you don't need to go. You're just going to be eaten by cannibals. It's, it's worthless. And Patton responded to that statement with this declaration of faith and trust in Jesus and his resurrection that was going to come one day. And this was his bold reply. He said, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now. And your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer." When I read statements like these or I hear statements like these and and like the one that we just heard read from the Apostle Peter that he made in our text today, I'm deeply encouraged and my heart is filled with this resolve. It's filled with hope and joy because I want to believe with everything I have that these statements are true about Jesus and about the future and about hope. And And I really do. Both John Patton and Peter had this resolve in their being, something that had to have come from outside themselves, that they would follow Jesus to the very end, even if it meant death. And and what I want you to know is it wasn't because they finally made some smart decision along the way. It was because they had been brought to a point by the sovereign work of the living Spirit of God that they understood that they had no other option that Jesus was the only way. And they didn't have any other choice but to surrender their life 
to Jesus once they saw who he really was. This only option of following Jesus is what we're going to see in our time together today. That when all is said and done, that when all the things of this age that we've run to for fulfillment and purpose, things like money and, and happiness and, and seeking all these things, that when all that's stripped away and it's all let us down, that there's nowhere else to go but Jesus, because he is the one who has the words of life. I want to welcome you again to this gathering of New Eden Church. As always, it is just uh, an honor and privilege to gather as the covenant people of God, united around the good news of Jesus and his kingdom. As you heard read, we're continuing in our series through the Gospel of John, and we'll be finishing up chapter 6 today, starting in verse 60 all the way through the end of the chapter, verse 71. We Hopefully, we'll have the scripture on the screen. We were having a little bit uh, of problems with the program back there, so if they're not, you'll just have to follow along um, either on your phone or in your copy of the scriptures. So if you remember the last few weeks before our text today, we've seen Jesus amassing some crowds, right? We got to see him have some personal conversations at the beginning of the book. And more recently, we've seen him interacting with bigger crowds. And it started with him feeding uh, the 5,000 or probably more like 15,000 with uh, five loaves and two fish. And the crowd starts following him. And then last week, we looked at the message of Jesus, which was on the hinges, like he used his, his uh, miracle as a springboard to talk about himself as the true bread of life who's offered himself up as the living sacrifice to bring redemption for everyone who believes in him, which is the point of the whole book of John, so that we might believe. During his conversation last week, which we didn't see this, but it started off as kind of some dialogue and it moved to some teaching in a synagogue. We heard Jesus say some things that were hard for his followers to grasp. These were the people who called themselves his disciples, but it was just in the light sense of the word. They weren't fully committed. They were just following Jesus kind of for the show. And so when Jesus would say some hard things, they had some objections and some questions and some pushback. And today in our text, it's coming right on the heels of that teaching. And we're going to get to see varying responses to the message that Jesus proclaimed. See, anytime the message of Jesus is proclaimed, there's a couple different responses, and it's based on our, our faith and on our belief. If we either believe in his message, then his message is life to us. But that same message for those who reject him is repulsive and narrow-minded. Today in our text, the author of our gospel records for us the message of Jesus and the way people respond to that message. So let's dive in together by looking at the first thing we'll see during our time together, the offense of Jesus's message. The offense of the message of Jesus. Look again at verses 60 and 61. So therefore, when this whole teaching that we looked at last week, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, asked them, does this offend you? See, here his disciples, which is the large crowd. This isn't the 12. Uh, John, our author, is going to um, set them apart in a minute. We'll see that later. But this crowd hears about all the things Jesus has to say about eating his flesh and drinking his blood and, and, and pushing against the idea of self-reliance and talking about the sovereignty of God, the responsibility of man to trust solely in Christ alone, and they don't like this. They say, this is a hard saying. This word hard is like harsh. It's not hard to understand. It's hard to accept. That's why they say, who could accept this? And so they're kind of grumbling among themselves. Jesus being supernatural, right? He hears this. See, he knows that this giant crowd, even though they were following Jesus and they liked kind of the show, but when Jesus spoke directly about what type of kingdom he came to bring and the way in which his kingdom advances, they don't like it. Like the Jesus that heals and brings good food. Like, yeah, we like that Jesus. That's cool. But when it starts coming to the core tenant of the kingdom of God, which was the person of Jesus himself, they don't like it. And so Jesus knows this because he's supernatural. So he asked them, are you guys offended at this? Does this message bother you? And he calls them out on this. See, the gospel message will necessarily at times offend because people, myself included, don't like to be told that we need to trust in something outside of ourselves. We're repulsed by this idea of the cross of Jesus and the fact that my sin made that necessary. 
We don't like that. The fact that I need a savior, because that means I have to admit that I have a problem. Now, the fact that the gospel offends, this is not an excuse for us to be jerks, right? Like that's, I hear people say, oh, the gospel is just offensive. I saw one pastor tweet. He said, yes, the gospel is offensive, but sometimes you're just a jerk. And that's true, right? So this isn't the point here. This isn't what Jesus is doing. He's not just trying to offend people. Multiple times in the teachings of Jesus, he's shown them his love for them. And he's saying, hey, guys, I'm telling you this, these hard sayings that you're having a hard time grasping because I want you to know where to find true life. And the things you're searching for and the things you're looking for, even the things you're trying to make me become like a political leader, they can't give you true life. Jesus, even though it seems harsh, wants them to see the end result of their self-reliance. You can't just take Jesus and add him on to what you already want to do. It seems from our text that there were three main things that they were offended about. As I was thinking of this, what was it that actually offended them? And looking at last week's text and this week's text, it seemed like there were three things. The first one seemed like it was the divinity of Jesus that offended them. You don't see it as much in this week's text as we did last week, but they didn't like when Jesus equated himself with God. They were okay with the Jesus when he was just this healer and he could do some cool tricks and bring some food, right? But when he claimed to be one with Yahweh the Father, it was hard for them to accept that. When he said, I'm from heaven and I'm going back there, they were like, whoa, we don't know what to do with that. Because if that's true, we have to believe everything that he says. See, if he's God, we can't just pick and choose what teachings of his we like. This is still an offensive point today. There are many who are okay with Jesus as a cool teacher, a nice guy. We can just kind of, you know, he had some cool stuff, man. He was kind of radical, right? I like that stuff, you know, Sermon on the Mount, decent stuff in there. Pick and choose it, right? But to call him God, that goes a little too far. Because again, if it's true, we have to believe everything he said. We, We don't get to pick and choose. If we believe he's God, we have to believe the stuff that some of us don't like about giving money away to the poor, about loving our enemies, about treating all people equally, you know, the social justice stuff, right? And some of us don't like that, but then simultaneously, we also have to believe what he says about personal holiness and human sexuality and what we do with our body and our money and our time. And we're like, whoa, we don't like that, right? Like at some point, Jesus will buck up against our own desires. And so we can either push against it and try to manipulate him and not believe he's divine or we can surrender to it. Secondly, it seems they were not only offended by the divinity of Jesus, but by the death of Jesus. Look at verse 62. This is what he's getting at. He says, does this offend you? What if, then what if you were to observe the son of man ascending to where he was before? He's saying, you think you're offended now? Wait till you get to observe it up close and personal what's going to happen. One of the things that the disciples of Jesus pushed against, even his inner circle, was when Jesus talked about giving up his life. They didn't understand how this, what they wanted to be a political Messiah, how his kingdom could advance by him dying and giving up his life for his enemies. Like, that's not how you start a revolution. It doesn't work that way. This was so countercultural to their understanding of the way a kingdom should progress forward. And that's what our author is getting at with this language of ascension. Now, we primarily think of the ascension of Jesus as as when he goes back to the Father after the resurrection. But in our book, the Gospel of John, our author collapses the entire ascension narrative starting when he was lifted up on the cross. And that's where he talks about the ascension. And then as a part of that, he descends back to the grave and to death, but then he raises again. And so our author kind of collapses that entire ascension narrative into this one word. And they don't like this. See, the way to freedom with Jesus is through surrender. The way to life in the kingdom of God is through death. The way to power is through service. And he says, you think you're offended at my message now? Wait till you see me hanging on a bloody cross to die for the sins of the world. This wasn't just a metaphor for Jesus. He was actually going to give up his life. And this message of the cross in the way of Jesus is still offensive today. We don't like to hear it. 
There's just as much division in the church as there is in the world over issues like politics and policies because we've bought into the idea that the way to advance God's kingdom is through earthly, worldly means. That we've got to advance it the way that the earth says. It's our only hope. We hear it all the time. Biggest election in our lifetime. I've heard that my whole life. Because we think that the, that the outcome of the world depends on who is elected as the president. We really believe that sometimes. That's not the way the kingdom advances. The life and message of Jesus says, nope, not in my kingdom. You want to see my kingdom advance? Love your enemy. Self-sacrificial acts of surrender and suffering are how my kingdom advances. You only gain your life by losing it for the sake of others. You want a position of power in my kingdom? Serve the least among you. Then we start seeing what true power really is. We don't like that message. It means we've got to give up power and control in our own way of thinking. We've got to give up the stuff of this age that we've come to rely on to make us temporarily happy. This leads us to the last thing that offended them about the message of Jesus, which is dependence on Jesus. See, Jesus had a lot to say about the way into his kingdom and that it was through trust in him alone and not through self-reliance, that it was dependence solely on him. But this week, he probably says it the most plain of all. Look at verse 63. He says, the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. I love just how plain that is and like in your face. He's like, look, you want to follow me? You have to understand that the way of Jesus is complete dependence on me and on my spirit. You can't earn this. You can't do enough good deeds to make this happen. You have to fully surrender your life to me, give up your own plans and your own ways and your own religion and trust me to save you. And he says, your flesh is no help at all. He doesn't just say it doesn't help. He's like, at all. I mean, it's why Paul later said, I place no confidence in the flesh. He says, all the things, Paul says this later, all the things that I did to try to earn standing with God, they're all dung is the word he says, except he says something stronger that I can't say. Compared to the cross of Christ and his work, our righteousness is filthy rags. He said this a lot in our chapter already. Again, in verse 65, he says, no one can come unless it's granted to him by the Father. That we have to quit trying to earn it on our own and give up and surrender our own life. Give up control. And again, this is offensive. We like self-reliance, especially in a culture that says, and everybody thinks they've pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. We like that individualistic idea that we've made ourselves, right? Right? We like to be in control. We like to be in charge. We like to make the plans and execute them. And the irony is that even if we messed up time and time again, we still want to give it another run. We still want to try it ourselves because we trust ourselves rather than trust Jesus. We do it with our life plans, with our earthly pursuits, with our singleness, with our marriage, with our parenting, with our career, our education, with our ministry efforts. We take them into our own hands, trusting our own flesh because we can't stand the idea of letting it go. It's offensive for us. And so we see in this story the people offended by the divinity of Jesus, by the death of Jesus, and by the call to dependence on Jesus. But what I love about Jesus is that he's not just looking to offend to make people angry because he never shares an offensive message without making an offer, without making an invitation. We've seen the offense of Jesus' message and now we see the offer of Jesus' message the offer of the message of Jesus. See, even though Jesus knew there would be many that would be offended by his message, he always offered a way to God through himself. There was a way into his kingdom. Jesus doesn't just plainly tell you of the hopelessness of your own situation. He tells you just as plain where to find life. Look at the end of verse 63. He says, the words that I have spoken to you, I can hear him pleading with this crowd. They are spirit and they are life. But still there are some among you who don't believe. 
He says, look, I'm not telling you all this to try to drive you away. I'm telling you all this because I want you to come and receive me for me, not just for the gifts, not for the things I bring to the table, but simply for who I am. He wants them to have true and eternal life. He wants them to be who they were created to be, which is to be in union with their father at work with him. But with sadness, he says, there are some who don't believe. There's times where he wept over those that didn't believe. But this means that there were some who did, that there were some who accepted the offer of the message of Jesus. There were some who said, you know what? I see the hopelessness of my own plans. I relinquish control and I give you my life. And for those who did, they received the spirit and life. We'll get to see it more in a few weeks because our author is going to expound on it. But for those who trust in Jesus and believe his message, they get the very spirit of the living God. Like indwelt in you. They receive the very life source, the power, the comfort, all the things that we seek in this age, we get in the spirit of God. Power, comfort, security. We receive that truly in the spirit. And we still get it today. Like this is is something that we still have access to today, that there is a God who indwells in us and speaks to us and comforts us and guides us and teaches us. This is a real thing that actually happens. So they get the spirit and they also get life. Those who give up their life to follow Jesus truly find it. Those who forsake all to follow Jesus gain everything. Jesus has the words of eternal life. And even though his words are offensive to those who reject him, to those who receive him, his words are life. All the things that were offensive, think about it, the divinity of Jesus, the death of Jesus, dependence on Jesus, all those things when we receive him, they become sweet and life-giving, not repulsive. When we see the divinity of Jesus and we realize he's God, so we don't have to be, it's freeing. We can quit trying to be God and instead trust that he knows best. When we see the death of Jesus and understand that that's the way his kingdom goes forth and we see it as the way that we were brought into the kingdom through his death, we can follow his way. Even into death and suffering ourselves because we know that we will raise again because he was the first fruits and all those who follow him into his death also follow him into his resurrection. And this naturally leads us to dependence on Jesus. That's a sweet, good message. He's in control. You don't have to be. And and we mess it up. So that's good news. That even when we do mess it up, you can't mess up God's plans. We can simply walk in tune with the spirit that he's given us. Just like Jesus did. See, the same message is either an offense or an offering based on how we respond. What do we do with this message? As we saw last week, the work is to simply believe. And and how does this process of faith work? To be honest, I'm not exactly sure because it's God's work, not mine. But I do know that the scriptures and I will call you and they call us to implore you to trust in this Jesus because it is a life or death decision. It really is. See, in this passage, we see two primary responses to the message of Jesus, either reject it or receive it. And ultimately, when we reject the message of Jesus, we're not rejecting the message as much as we are rejecting him. You can't divorce what he says from who he is and his character. In verse 66, we're told that many of his followers walked away and followed him no more after this. They couldn't manipulate him, They couldn't surrender to him and his control, his lordship. So they walk away. And we see this even today. There's some who hang around Jesus in the church, maybe for a little bit. Maybe you were raised in the church. Like maybe people, it's it's culturally acceptable still in our community, right? Maybe it's a community of people. I can make friends. I can hang out with people, right? I can network a little bit. Maybe I'm even a little bit intrigued by the stuff that I've seen Jesus do and the the, the things that I've seen Christians post on Facebook. And that can even be emotionally real for a season. 
But when faced with the teachings of Jesus they don't like, or when faced with persecution from the world or temptations from the enemy, they walk away. And this isn't a surprise. Jesus told us this would happen. But, but my encouragement to you, if that's you, in those moments, don't just try to figure it all out and, and force yourself to believe, try to white knuckle it, or even try to get yourself to a point where you 100% agree with Jesus and everything he says. That's, that's not the point. What, what I encourage you to do in those moments is to run to Jesus, not from him. There is grace abundant in his arms for your doubts, for your questions, for your struggles. But don't reject them. This is life or death. So there are those who reject Jesus, but there are also those who receive him and remain with him. Hell or high water, as the old saying goes. We're going with you to the grave. Jesus said to the 12, look at John 6, 67. So after the crowd disperses, Jesus says to the 12, you don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is one of those statements that Peter makes that's just incredible. He would do this sometimes. Sometimes he says some really stupid stuff. But sometimes it's like, dang, Peter, that was so good. He says this beautiful, doctrinally rich statement, not even fully understanding everything he was saying. And, and he kind of speaks on behalf of all of the 12. And I love the language that Peter uses. It's so honest about kind of how he comes to faith in the person of Jesus. It's not like most of us when we talk about our journey um, with Jesus Right? We try to clean it up and talk about how sure we are that if we were to die today, 100% sure we're going to heaven. Right? Like We try to clean it up and convince ourselves how sure we are of the decision we made. And we even use language like, yeah, I decided to get saved. Like, like Think about it. As if one day we were like, well, shoot, guess I better decide to have someone show up and save me today. Like, like, let, if you want to see the ridiculousness of that, and I've said it before too, but, but think about a man who was saved from drowning and was rescued and Later, he's telling you the story. And he's like, yeah, well, I was gasping for breath, you know, just trying to survive and kept going under. I looked around and thought, hmm, who do I want to come rescue me today? That guy over there on the shore looks like he could do it. Let me, let me decide to have him come rescue me today. Decide to get rescued. I made the decision to get rescued. Right? Like, that's not how he would tell the story. He would be like, I was going under, I was gasping for breath, and I'm just crying out for help, and out of nowhere, so-and-so showed up and rescued me. He's like, I was desperate, and I would have taken whatever option I could have had to have relief. And this is more like what Peter is saying. He's like, where else are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. You're it. You're the guy. It's all we've got. Are we going to go to the world? Are we going to go to each other? We need rescuing, and you're the one who can do it. And I love how he says he knows and believes. He says, we have come to know and believe. He says, it's all you. We came to the realization that we believed and we know this to be true, not just because we logically figured it out one day. And like, I think God can use logical evidence as a part of our journey to faith. But at the end of the day, the Spirit gives us eyes to see and we wake up and realize, oh shoot, there's no other option I have but to believe this Jesus stuff. C.S. Lewis described it as him coming to God, kicking and screaming and looking for a way out, but God wouldn't have it. And that's more accurate to our journey. I don't know. We just believe. It's all we got. Doesn't mean it's perfect from there on out, but it does mean that when it's real, we've got nowhere else to go. We're stuck in this for better or worse, hell or high water, we're going for the ride. And this doesn't mean that we just float. That's not it at all. Jesus gives them Judas as a warning. He says, hey, Judas is one of the 12. Proximity to Jesus doesn't mean true belief. And true knowing Jesus, knowing about Jesus, is not knowing Jesus. Even the devils believe. Trusting in this Jesus is an active, ongoing work. 
but it's not our work, it's the work of Jesus. And it's empowered by the Spirit, sustained by His work that He's already accomplished. Peter said that he knew who Jesus was, who he says he was. He says, you are the Holy One of God. So this promise, these words of eternal life are based in his character and who he is. That's how he knew he could trust him. But still, like, I, I love this confession of Peter. And maybe some of you are there today where you can say this wholeheartedly, full-throated with him. But even though he made this confession later, he messed it up bad. Same with the missionary, John Patton, who we saw earlier. If I left his story with that statement, you'd all think he was this amazing missionary who went and served for 40, 50 years and everything turned out great, never doubted. But that's not what happened. You read his writings, the moment he landed on the shores, he doubted. Why am I here? Why did I leave my fruitful ministry where I was comfortable? I don't even think these people would understand what Christianity is. And then a few months in, both his wife died while giving birth and his 36-day-old son died 36 days later. And he had to literally sleep on their graves so their bodies wouldn't be dug up and eaten. And his writings recount his struggles. He even uses that word. But he always came back to the fact that in the end, he just couldn't help but believe that Jesus was worth it. And Jesus was faithful with John Patton, and he was faithful with Peter. Later in this same gospel account, we're going to see Peter denies Jesus. He does everything he said he wouldn't do. He betrays Jesus. He walks away, and he says, I'm done. I'm going back to my old life. We're going to get to see it more in John 21, but I love the story. Peter's forsaken Jesus, and Jesus comes to him on the shore when he's Again, at the end of his rope, because Peter trying to fish, it wasn't working out without the power of Jesus. So Jesus shows up and he cooks some breakfast, which I love. Just calls them friends. Some translations say children. It's come, come have a meal. And it says, and after the meal, so they just sat there awkwardly. Peter's probably full of shame and guilt because he's denied Jesus. He's walked away. But Jesus restores him and he encourages him. And you know how he encourages them? He says, you're going to die for me one day. Like, great encouragement, Jesus. Thanks for that. <laughs> but for someone who understood after the resurrection, this is after Jesus has risen from the grave, that that's actually what I want to be willing to, to die for you because I believe that that's where true life is found. I give up my life. See, and here's what we need to know. The object of our faith, Jesus, is way more important than the amount or the consistency of our faith. Jesus did the perfect work. He had the perfect trust and belief. So we don't have to. It's why he lived the perfect life on our behalf. He faced death in the face. And even though he said, God, let this cup pass from me, he said, not my will, but thine be done. I trust you. And he never turned back from the Father's plan, even though people turned back from him. He followed it all the way to the bloody cross where he would be high and lifted up for the sins of the world. And even though he was betrayed, he never betrayed his bride. And his death is what brings us eternal life. Just like he said he would. His resurrection proves that. It shows us that no matter what we lose to follow Christ, that in the end, it's all worth it. And somehow, and I can't explain it, but even as you walk through suffering and pain, all that somehow proves to work a greater glory in the end, just like the cross of Christ did. The resurrection wouldn't have even happened without the cross. And it was so much more powerful and meaningful because Jesus really suffered and died and bled. And somehow that happens in our life. And I can't explain it. And on this side of eternity, it's more like a cycle where there's death, resurrection, surrender, death, suffering, resurrection, death, resurrection. And some things won't be resurrected until the final day. And I hate that. But the good news of Jesus is what causes us to realize, even in the darkest moments of our life, I got nowhere else to go. This is it. This is all I got. I'll, I'll follow you anywhere, Jesus. Death, okay, I don't get it. Doesn't make sense, but it's one foot in front of the other. Here we go. Going to the ends of the earth to share the gospel. Sure, just following you in the everyday stuff of life, believing you when you say that just living a quiet life and seeking peace with all that that matters, that has value and purpose, 
sure, I'll trust you. And as we're united to him in his suffering, our grip on the things of this age is loosened. We're free to give as we've been freely given to. His words are not repulsive or harsh. They are life. And we trust him with our lives and with our stuff. And this is why Jesus, why John told us he wrote this book so that we'd believe in Jesus and have life. We have nowhere else to run but Jesus, but that's the only place we need. And the power of the message of Jesus, and I can't explain how this has happened, but it's something that I've come to believe with every fiber of my being and not in my own strength and not perfectly, not every moment of every day, but when all is said and done, I will stake my life on the fact that Jesus lived, died, was buried, and resurrected. And that that truth is what change changes lives. And I can't help it. I can't tell you how. I can give you a little bit of a timeline, a little bit of a story. But I've come to believe and know it to be so. And that's why every single week, that's all you're going to get is Jesus that's all I have to offer. That's all we have to offer as a church. Like this church will live or die based on the, the trust that the proclamation of Jesus is enough to build his church and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Through doubt, through pain, through fear, through struggle, through grief, through agony, I'm gonna run to Jesus. Not because I'm some great person, but because he first ran to me. And I beg you to do the same. It's worth it. At the end of one of his letters that Paul, that Peter, excuse me, wrote to the church. It's the same Peter who made this confession today and had his struggles and his doubts. He wrote this in 1 Peter 5.10. He says, after you have suffered a little while, the suffering here is in the context of resisting the temptations of the enemy, which Peter knew about intimately. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself personally, intimately restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You can't tell me Peter wasn't thinking about that moment on the shore when Jesus himself, God himself, strengthened him, restored him, confirmed him, and established him. And he does the same for us. Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life.